Thank you very much, Howard. Um, I have a paper about a very serious topic, but I'm going to wear my exhibitions uh, hat for just a moment and mention two shows since you're here at the Canadian Museum of Immigration Pier 21. Uh, the World of Yosef Karsh is a an amazing photo exhibit on our first floor. Uh, Karsh, Yosef Karsh is the um, uh, legendary portrait photographer, an Armenian refugee who uh, created all those iconic images that you have in your head when you think of Winston Churchill, uh, um, uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway, and we've got 110 of Karsh's work downstairs, including uh, uh, the portrait of the last sailmaker of St. John, New Brunswick, and uh, Edward Steichen, the famous uh, World War II naval photographer. Um, so that's one exhibit. The other exhibit is, if you're using the washrooms up here, we have an exhibit in both the men's and women's washrooms about hygiene and immigration. Uh, <laughs> to sort of uh, making you kind of think about uh, sort of uh, washroom and toilet issues in the, the world of immigration. So there's an exhibit you can take just when you're on your break. Um, so, um, uh, but I'm going to be speaking about the Jewish refugee ship of St. Louis in 1939. And just um, a show of hands, uh, how many people know the St. Louis story, this refugee ship from 39? Okay, that gives me a, a good sense. Um, in many ways, it's a, it's a powerful, well-known story of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, a uh, ship with almost a thousand Jewish people fleeing Europe on the eve of the Second World War, seeking to escape Nazi Germany, uh, and being turned away by everyone in North America, the United States, uh, all the Latin American countries, and in the end, Canada. Um, it's a powerful story that's become better known in many years, but there's some very significant Canadian connections which are often overlooked. Uh, you know, St. Louis made her first voyage to Halifax, to this very terminal that we're now occupying at this conference. She made her last voyage to Halifax uh, in 1939, and um, uh, her, her infamous refugee voyage had intimate connections with, uh, with Canada and Canada's immigration policy. I'm going to review those and also share a few pitfalls. If you're a museum that's looking at the St. Louis story, a couple things you should kind of watch out for that, that, we, that we learned as we discussed the story. So uh, the, the motor ship uh, St. Louis was part of the uh, post-war building, uh, rebuilding program of the um, Hamburg America Line, a giant German ocean liner, uh, of, often one of the biggest ocean liner companies in the North Atlantic. They were rebuilding their World War I losses, and they invested money in two new ships, the um, St. Louis and the Milwaukee, uh, um, uh, both named after cities in the United States with large immigrant German populations. And these were state-of-the-art ships. They were motor ships, so they were, uh, they were leaving the world of coal-fired steamships uh, uh, and was in, uh, uh, one of the first big introductions of a pair of ships using uh, diesel engines, uh, which had, were more economical, they were cleaner, and, uh, and were kind of the, the world of the future. Uh, uh, Cunard was experimenting the same time with Georgic and, uh, and Britannic uh, with a pair of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, diesel ships as well. Uh, uh, because they were diesel, they didn't need those big shotgun smokestacks that are funnels that you see on the uh, traditional steam-powered liners. They had a radically different streamlined look and they were sort of the future at sea. Um, and uh, uh, Hamburg American Line emphasized the modernity of their uh, sort of their sort of new look, uh, brilliant electric lights everywhere, state-of-the-art athletic facilities. Um, and uh, so they're, um, they're launched, they were launched in uh, 1928, the uh, same year that um, uh, Halifax launched its new immigration terminal, the building that you're sitting in now. Uh, Pier 21 was a brand new uh, complex of integrated um, railway station, ocean liner terminal, and hotel. As you can see in the photo, those of you st who stay are staying at the Westin, there's your hotel. It was built as part of this whole complex. Enormous investment of the Canadian government to make Halifax a major international uh, passenger terminal for ships and immigration centre, Canada's Ellis Island as it's sometimes referred to. So um, St. Louis and, uh, and Pier 21 sort of um, uh, began uh, their lives in the same year. And um, uh, St. Louis's maiden voyage in 1929 uh, was from uh, Hamburg, Germany to Halifax and then on to New York. And her, um, her first call at, 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 at Pier 21 was a huge deal in Halifax. Um, the, um, uh, the Halifax Herald kind of wrote uh, uh, um, an enthusiastic editorial about, um, seldom has any transatlantic liner ever departed directly for Halifax on her maiden voyage. This event is expected to arouse great interest throughout the city. She's one of the most modern motor ships afloat, especially constructed for the North Atlantic passenger trade for Canada and the United States. So they were really hoping that this would put Halifax on the map as a, as a, uh, with its brand new facilities that you know, had appear so large it could take Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary at the same time, end to end. And uh, St. Louis was a good, a, a good sign of a maiden voyage that she would uh, put Halifax on the map. Now, however, as, as uh, 
at Pier 21 in St. Louis were beginning their careers, um, just as they began in, uh, in full operation in 1929, the Great Depression hit. And the world was plunged into economic crisis and mass un unemployment. And uh, one of the uh, St. Louis's voyages in uh, 19, um, 1930, a family of Serbians uh, arriving at, at Pier 21 aboard the St. Louis kind of encountered the kind of the changing face of immigration as the Great Depression kind of gripped hold of the world. Uh, the Bovidid families, they were kind of Christians from Serbia, but they were clearly Eastern European immigrants. And uh, they, they had a vivid memory of their reception in Halifax. Um, the, uh, um, uh, Paul Bovis, the, the uh, son, kind of described the experience uh, um, of arriving in Halifax in the June 12, 1930. Along with the welcoming of th 30 to 40 people, we were greeted with loud boos and shouts of, go back where you came from, and then a barrage of eggs and stale veggies. This fracas continued until police arrived and order was restored. So this is the land we heard so much about of milk and honey. Being welcomed by so many citizens with eggs and spoiled green, he, or he splattered all over the front deck of the boat, barely missing me. Prove one fact, Canada is the land of milk and honey and veggies. So uh, hats off to the Bovid family for, um, for uh, being stalwart in their arrival in a country that was gripping with this uh, depression, but also this paranoia about immigrants coming to change society and steal jobs. And uh, this, uh, this caused the Canadian authorities to ratchet up the restrictions on immigration. And it, they plunged by 80%. 80, 80%. So the uh, levels of immigration as you go into the 30s, uh, sort of it's one-fifth of what it was before. And you can see that in St. Louis's visits. So, you know, her first year, she brought 1,000 immigrants uh, to Canada through Pier 21. Um, uh, by 1930, it was, uh, it was about um, 83 immigrants um, and uh, as the, um, the restrictions ag against immigrants arrived. And this would really imperil Jewish refugees who are trying to flee Nazi Germany after the uh, Hitler's National Socialist Party comes into power in 1934, that um, they, they find um, that um, there's an incredibly hostile approach to immigrants of all kinds coming to North America, and specifically uh, uh, Jewish people because of the widespread anti-Semitism of the era. Um, so uh, the, um, but St. Louis, as a sort of a, into the 1930s, um, all the other big shipping lines canceled their order books at shipyards. So St. Louis was actually one of the newest lotion liners afloat in the 1930s, and her engines made her very efficient and economical to run, and she kept calling at Pier 21, sort of a voyage after voyage in the 1930s. It's an amazing shot of St. Louis uh, here at Pier 21. She's the uh, ship on the left of the big black hull, Hamburg America Line twin funnels, and she's moored exactly where the Holland America Line Zandam is currently sitting sitting outside of our reception room. So if we were here in 1939 when this picture was taken, you'd be looking up at St. Louis. And there she is with St. Louis on the, uh, the left, uh, uh, Cunard's uh, Corinthia in the center, and then Cunard's new motor ship, the Georgic, off on the other side, a very busy day at Pier 21. So St. Louis continues to come to Halifax year after year through the 1930s. Um, passenger levels really drop across the North Atlantic in the mid-30s, so she does some recreational cruises in between her transatlantic immigrant voyages, but, uh, but um, keeps coming to Canada. And that sets her up for a unique voyage in 1939, June, uh, May of 1939. Um, uh, uh, Jews in Germany have been subject, subjected to the Kristallnacht attacks in uh, November of the previous year, where um, homes, businesses, and synagogues were attacked and burned, people were murdered, and it was the beginning of the escalating violence of the Holocaust. And many German families saw the writing on the wall and sought to leave, and um, there were enough of them that they booked a special voyage aboard the St. Louis. Um, uh, to escape Nazi Germany and find sanctuary in North America. So um, uh, 937 uh, Jewish passengers uh, boarded uh, um, St. Louis in, in, in Coxhagen uh, next to Hamburg in um, uh, May 13, 1939, uh, seeking sanctuary in North America. And they, um, they, they, uh, they all, almost all had visas to land in Cuba and um, thought they could use that as a base to find a, a safe home in North America, most of them seeking family and community connections in the United States. And um, so they left um, Hamburg on this, this voyage in, in May of 1939. And um, here's an example of, uh, I always get, <laughs> this, this photo always kind of chokes me, chokes me up a bit. It's two Jewish families aboard the St. Louis, mid-voyage, heading to what they think is safety 
and freedom in North America. It's the, um, the Hyman and the Dublon families. And you can see how happy they are. They have escaped and they're heading to safety. Um, and so the, um, uh, you can see sort of a, the, the fellow at the, uh, the center is, uh, is Willie um, um, uh, Dublon um, with his wife Erna, uh, his um, brother Eric, and the two little girls, Eva and Lori. So they're on this ship seeking what they think is, is going to be safety. However, when they arrive at Havana, they discover their visas mid-voyage had all been canceled. And um, only a handful of families who had um, transit papers directly to the United States are allowed to leave the ship, leaving 907 trapped on board in Havana Harbor. And um, at that point, a committee is formed among the passengers to try to find sanctuary somewhere. And uh, working with the captain of, of the, of the, the ship, um, who, Gustav Schroeder, who was a, a humanitarian, really sympathized with the plight of his, his passengers, this desperate search for a country who would take them began uh, with telegrams going out and uh, lots and lots of uh, denial replies coming back. Um, the plight of these passengers made, you know, huge international news. Most of the mainstream media coverage was, was, uh, was positive, not so much the letters to the editor. And, um, but first of all, the United States said no, um, and then every Latin American country that they contacted said no, and then uh, Canada got involved. Um, um, there were a number of Jewish members of parliament who petitioned the Canadian Prime Minister, um, as well as um, a group of um, historians and intellectuals from Toronto who uh, put together a very kind of persuasive petition that they telegrammed to Canada's um, Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King. He was busy with a royal tour at the moment, but they kind of pitched this kind of appeal to, you know, King, you know, you're at a moment in history, you can make a difference, um, uh, the, the world is kind of watching, and, you know, out of Christian charity and a sense of citizenship, you should let these folks in. And um, so this was kind of an appeal um, put forward in, um, uh, well, well, St. Louis was kind of um, just giving up in North America and starting to head back to, to Europe. Um, Canada's Prime Minister was on the road at the time. He was moved by this enough to uh, send, send messages back to Ottawa to his officials and cabinet saying, well, okay, what are my options here? What could we do? And um, unfortunately, he had some deeply anti-Semitic uh, cabinet ministers. Uh, also, particularly the Director of Immigration of Canada, a fellow named Frederick Blair, just hated Jewish people. And uh, they quickly persuaded Mackenzie that there would be a deep political cost to pay for allowing these, uh, these folks in. And uh, King decided to do nothing. And the petitioners got a message weeks later after St. Louis had, had, had to uh, return to Europe saying, uh, well, you know, um, uh, we got your, your appeal, but we can't, uh, we've made successions for some small numbers of Jewish families. Uh, fish procedures don't allow us to do more. And Canada said no. Um, and the ship then had to return, our Canada was their kind of last hope for sanctuary, and had to return to, to Europe uh, in a despondent return voyage. Um, the, um, they, they, the committee had to form suicide watch for a lot of families, and the Captain Gustav Schroeder actually kind of cooked up a plan. He was going to run the ship aground uh, on the southern coast of England so that they wouldn't have to face returning to Nazi Germany. In the end, there was a last-minute diplomatic uh, uh, solution of sorts. Um, uh, four European countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Great Britain, agreed to take the passengers of St. Louis. Uh, and so the ship uh, returned to Antwerp instead of Hamburg, and then families had to make this choice about which of these four countries do we go to. Um, so it was temporary sanctuary, but this was on the eve of World War II, um, and so three of those countries were overrun by the Nazis the next year uh, with the, uh, the um, occupation of Europe, and then these families were on the run again and uh, facing the Gestapo, the SS, and the death camps. Um, so it's, um, it's a grim story, um, and uh, um, uh, it's um, uh, um, a real kind of... Um, um, thought-provoking story about how you apply to an international refugee crisis. It, ironically, even though the war was almost there, there was sort of a, only two months left, St. Louis managed to make a few extra voyages um, uh, um, for, to the New York World's Fair and um, uh, to, um, to some Caribbean voyages. And this is a postcard from the collection of the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic from St. Louis's last voyage in, um, uh, in August, late August of uh, 1939, where she, took, uh, she went to Halifax, took a bunch of people to the New York World's Fair, and then the war broke out, trapping her briefly in New York until she was able to escape back to Germany before the British naval blockade went in to, to reply. And this is a 
postcard that was sent by somebody on board the St. Louis on that final voyage. Uh, purely recreational, there were no immigrants aboard, it was just Canadians going off to see the New York World's Fair. And um, there's a really powerful note on this, uh, this voyage that gives you an idea just how deep and widespread anti-Semitism was in North American culture. It's some anonymous Canadian vacationing family, and they talk about what a nice ship it is, and no one's been seasick. Lovely staterooms, good food, nice crowd, no Jews. And this was a postcard that sort of was written after all that media coverage about these desperate refugees. And here's um, a Canadian couple saying, it's great, there's, they've gotten rid of all the Jewish people on this ship. And it gives you an idea of just sort of uh, how profoundly anti-Semitism was shared in Canadian society at the time. Um, the ship, uh, St. Louis, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Schroeder managed to get it back into Germany, spent the rest of the war tied up, uh, uh, and the port of Kiel being used as a temporary um, uh, naval barracks, uh, was sort of bombed and uh, burnt out by Allied bombers in 1944, used for a, a bit of post-war uh, hotel accommodation, and then was finally scrapped in 1952. Now, the fate of the passengers, uh, that was uncertain for many years. Uh, there were, you know, 907 pe seven people divided among four countries, uh, and the records of the death camps were, it took a long time to, to go through. But uh, researchers um, uh, have now determined that 254 of the 907 were killed by the Nazis, uh, mostly murdered at Auschwitz and Sobeborg uh, death camps, uh, including the entire Dublin family. Uh, they all perished, uh, mostly at, at Auschwitz. So those are 254 people that, um, that someone in North America, including Canada, could have given a refuge and safety to. Um, uh, this, yeah, this wasn't until 2010 that we got the full number. People had speculated over the years, but we now know that uh, just under 30% of the passengers who returned to Europe were, um, were killed in the Holocaust. Um, uh, the 2010 book, Refuge Denied, by Sarah Miller and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Scott Miller kind of uh, really kind of gave us a fine uh, um, sense of that number. Now, um, the, uh, there are a few mysteries that remain about St. Louis. Um, and one is um, uh, the um, we uh, don't know that um, that she ever con the passengers ever contacted the Canadian government directly. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the passengers frantically contacted Washington, um, uh, Mexico City. Uh, there's a telegram they sent to Paris trying to find sanctuary, but nobody's found a paper trail of them p petitioning the Canadian government. Maybe there's one out there, we haven't found it yet. Uh, and we also, there are many stories of Jewish families who managed to escape to North America through Pier 21, and some probably aboard St. Louis in previous voyages. We don't really know their stories either, and there's some, some more stories to be told there. There are also some myths. This is a classic image. You'll see this all the time portraying St. Louis, and uh, it's uh, often captioned as sort of uh, Jewish families arriving at Havana Hope, uh, Harbor, hopefully looking for sanctuary. And it's actually um, uh, 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 two people arriving in the state of Israel in 1949 at Hafa Harbor. Um, uh, um, but it's such a, a powerful image. And uh, Mia Culpa, when we did the first version of St. Louis Ship of Fate at the Maritime Museum in the Atlantic, we used this photo, um, uh, um, uh, which was in, the, in uh, Voyage of the Dam, the classic book at that time, and was on the US Holocaust Memorial Museum site as being St. Louis. We now know that it's not, so beware that. And uh, there's also a classic image of uh, uh, St. Louis in Hamburg Harbor that's often used to portray St. Louis as in, in Havana to, to be aware of. So um, the, uh, um, I'll just kind of close with, um, uh, there's a famous quote from this era that sums up Canadian immigration policy called, none is too many. It's, um, uh, it's um, a, uh, um, uh, often attributed to the Canadian Prime Minister or the, the immigration director, Frederick Blair. When he was asked how many Jews should come to Canada, he said, none is too many at the time of the St. Louis. It was actually a remark made after the war in 1945, after the facts of the Holocaust had become known. And um, the, uh, um, uh, so it's actually a later remark, but it really em uh, um, emphasizes uh, just how deep some of the hostility towards Jewish people uh, existed in the Canadian Immigration Service. And uh, so I um, realize I've gone over, so I'm gonna hand things back to, uh, to, uh, to the panel. Great. Thank you, Dan, for sharing the tragic story of the St. Louis refugees. Uh, our next speaker is uh, David Jenkins, who's going to speak to us about Slate, Salt Cod, and Schooners, a Welsh-Canadian maritime link. David is an honorary research fellow at the Museum of Wales and has a BA, PhD in history uh, from Wales. He is also honorary research fellow at the Department of History and Classics at Swansea University. Excuse me. 
fellow of the so Society of Antiquaries of London, member of the editorial board of Folklife, and a member of the British Commission for Maritime History. His main research interests are in Welsh uh, merchant shipping history from circa 1750 to the present day. His publications include books and articles related to this theme. Specialized in the history of Cardiff's tramp shipping industry, looking at such aspects as the development of the local ship owners association, individual ship owners such as Sir uh, William Reardon Smith, and the history of shipping companies founded at Cardiff by natives of the coastal communities of North and West Wales in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Please join me in welcoming David Jenkins. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour. Um, I want to speak this morning at a totally historic lecture, nothing to do with museums, but it does have important links with one of the founders of this organization, which I think is particularly appropriate in this year, namely, of course, Basil Greenhill. So, here's Wales. Sorry, I don't have a pointer, but if you look in the armpit of Cardigan Bay, you will see Porth Madog. Um, right in the sort of centre top, and it's this port at which, um, between 1893 and 1914, a series of remarkable schooners known as the Western Ocean Yachts were built, and they had very, very close connections with this part of the world. But it's Slate that begins our story. Twelve miles inland from Porth Madog, you have the Slate quarrying town of Blaenefestiniog, and this is a typical landscape of um, Blaenefestiniog in the early 20th century. Um, it's known as the piss pot of Wales, but um, one of the good things about that is that you've got gallons and gallons of water to drive all your machinery in the mills. And then Porth Madoc itself developed as a port from 1823 onwards. You can see in the foreground here the exit of the river Glaslin, which had been dammed um, from the sea to reclaim land. And it was this fact that the river flowed through this narrow gap, scoured out a harbor that created Porth Madrug from the 1820s onwards. And another important connection was the opening in 1836 of a narrow gauge railway from Porth Madrug down to, sorry, from Blenifacin, York down to Porth Madrug and steam traction was um, employed from the mid-1860s onwards, including these um, unique double-ended engines um, engineered by um, Robert Fairley. And, of course, the line is still open today as a tourist attraction, one of the oldest operating railway companies, continually operating railway companies in the world. Slate is an awkward cargo. It's heavy, it's brittle. You've got to load it in by hand. You can't just tip slate into a ship. So you pack it, you pack it tightly so it doesn't move, but don't pack it too tightly or you open the seams of your ship up and you've obviously got problems. So, um, but anyway, from, as I say, from the, um, 18, from the early 1890s onwards, this was the port at which um, these ships were built. And you can just about see the shipyard, see the um, schooner in the right foreground will her four top masts is pointing at one of the two yards, um, the, those of David Williams and David Jones, at which these unique vessels were built um, around the turn of the 19th century, 20th century. And here is one of them. Um, and as you can see, they were elegant vessels. Even though they were practical cargo carriers, they were also extremely elegant vessels. And this is the William Pritchard on the River Elbe in the early 20th century. Why on the River Elbe? Well, in 1842, there had been a massive fire in Hamburg, which absolutely flattened the city, pretty similar to the Great Fire of London in um, 1666. And um, some of the agents of the slate quarries in North Wales were out there pretty quickly saying, look, we've got this wonderful stuff that you could put on the roofs of your new buildings when you go on to build them. And so started the long tradition of taking slate from North Wales to Hamburg, to Bremerhaven, to Bremen, also to Copenhagen. Now, 
here we see the elegance of the vessels, but they also had to be tough, chunky vessels. Here is another of them, the M.A. James, at low tide in Ilfracombe in North Devon in the 1930s. And you can see that massive, deep, powerful hull that was needed for the trade in which these vessels began to work in the 1890s. And um, so, what happened? These vessels were built for a trade, a massive triangular trade. They would leave Porth Madog in the spring with a cargo of slate up to Hamburg or other places in northern Germany. They would then ballast down to Cadiz in Spain, discharge ballast, load salt, then straight out across the Atlantic to Newfoundland, um, Labrador, Nova Scotia, with salt for the um, salt fish trade. At that time, of course, the Grand Banks were still swarming with cod, and there was a demand for the dried and salted cod of North America, particularly in the Southern Catholic countries of Europe. And at one time, no home in Porth Madog would have been complete without an Italian ship portraitist. This is the work of Luigi Roberto, um, showing one of the Porth Madog schooners entering um, Naples. And um, ship portraits such as these would have been typical of um, any best parlour in Porth Madog um, uh, at that time. Um, the ships continued to be built until uh, 1913. They were locally owned, locally financed. Amongst the investors of them were a certain Mr. David and Mrs. Margaret Lloyd George. Um, so um, that um, they, because they were from the area. The last of them, the Gestiana, was built in 1913. Here she is at the day of her launch. You can see the bottle hanging down. The lady that swung the bottle failed to break it. That was seen as bad news. And indeed, um, on her maiden voyage to Labrador the following year, the Gestiana was washed ashore and smashed to bits. Um, but an even greater storm, of course, came later in August 1914 with the outbreak of the First World War, and that, of course, shattered the slate trade to Germany. So, this was the end of Porth Madog as a ship-owning port, but it wasn't the end of Porth Madog. Um, uh, sorry, it wasn't the end of the, um, the Western Ocean yachts, because a lot of them were sold away from Porth Madog in the um, post-war years. And here we have another link with Basil Greenhill, because um, some of the vessels were bought by um, the wonderful Captain Bill Slade of Appledore in North Devon, who ran these vessels right up until the Second World War. And here's the M.A. James, and you can see the um, imp or changes that he's made to her. He's taken down the yards from the fore topmast, and you can just about see a cloud of smoke erupting from the side of the um, hull alongside the mizzenmast. Well, that's actually, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Duh. <laughs> Remember what I just said, but you can see, you can see the cloud of smoke appearing. Now, the ship isn't on fire. It's one of those notoriously dodgy, awkward, Bollinger diesel engines, which you had to um, get a blow lamp to get going but at least it meant that the ships could um, motor through um, calms and so make them profitable. The few remaining ones were requisitioned during the Second World War to serve as um, barrage balloon um, mooring barges in um, Portsmouth and um, Plymouth Naval Dockyards, where basically they fell to bits. But thankfully, we do know a lot about them because um, Embrys Hughes compiled a list of not only of all the ships built at Porth Madog, um, but also all the ships that traded to Porth Madog. Um, he did this when he was home. Poor Dab, he spent his whole entire career as a sanitary inspector for Chorley in Greater Manchester, but came back regularly to Porth Madog to put the ships, uh, uh, put this list together. And together with Alad Eames, our great North Walian maritime historian, who was also a great friend of Basil's, they put together this wonderful record so the ships may be gone, but they're not forgotten. Tell them how.